hockey fans, are you ready to brave the wild? With me, your host, Paladino Joey, or Joey Awajan. Brave the Wild is available on all of your favorite podcasting apps. I thank each and every one of you once and always for downloading and listening to this show. The Minnesota, it is a great pleasure to be back on board with you once again today. The Minnesota Wild played three games this past week, returning from Sweden, and wind up going one and two. They finally won the last game <laughs> of the three and made a coaching change from Dean Evison to John Hines. Okay. That's the way you want it. That's the way you're going to get it. That's right, we do have a change at head coach, at least after the Detroit Red Wings game where the Wild lost 4-1 to in a hapless effort. Just meh. After a, a competitive but same old bleep loss to the, uh, that's basically what it was, competitive but same old bleep. Kind of like both of the games in Sweden where the Wild got two out of four points, both in overtime losses, which are still losses. Like if it was the postseason, you'd be getting swept. Think about it. You'd be getting swept, like losing seven games in a row, basically. But we got a couple points out of it. Yeah, but you're still lost, though. It still sucks. So <laughs> the points help. It's a little bit of a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of a consolation, but not a whole lot. And again, in the postseason, it don't mean diddly squat. Um, <clears throat> Dean Evanson, you know, obviously not somebody I was rooting for to get fired. But at the same time, a change was was, was needed. Kind of like Bill Guerin was saying, it was time. Now, I'm not 100% on Bill Guerin's side either when you think about this whole thing. But at the same time, it kind of was what it was. I mean, the Detroit game, what did I tweet out? Something like, yeah, I mean, something has to change. This is, something has to change. Like, what does that mean? Like, everybody after that game was like, something has to change. Dean Ebersett said, something has to change. And it, unfortunately for him, it was him. Um, like, clearly, things were not going to come back. Again, that's what Dean Guerin said in the press conference. The uh, John Hines press conference was also kind of like a... Uh, you know, like a requiem to um, Dean Evison's tenure with Minnesota. But a lot of people believe he will be a head coach again in the not-too-distant future, and he probably will, uh, him being, of course, Dean Evison. Um, we're going to look at Dean Evison's record a bit. We're going to kind of compare them side-by-side. Side. Thank you, Hockey Database. Obviously, really appreciate them. They're even following Brave the Wild, at Brave the Wild. So thank you so much. It was like the most random surprise uh, about a year and a half, year, about a year and a half ago. All of a sudden, Hockey database is following Brave the Wild. I'm like, oh, wow, that's awesome. <laughs> so definitely a nice honor there. So Dean Evison, of course, did play a nice, pretty good a pretty good bottom six career. Lots of penalty minutes, a gritty, tough guy. And that was the word you heard about every 10 seconds in the Dean Evison era was grit, 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 grit. And the very exciting comparison that a lot of people are happy about with John Hines is instead of hearing the word grit, 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 and grit, and more grit, we're hearing speed and more speed. It's showtime! Did you sense a smile from my voice? Did you, did you hear the smile? You know how you can hear somebody smile, kind of their voice changes a little bit? Speed. You know, even back in the day, NHL 94, 95, all that thing, it was, I always wanted the fastest team. I always wanted to just skate around people, and it worked, and I won championships on Super Nintendo. Yeah, I won championships on Super Nintendo. Hey, come on, you know, I could be the Scotty Bowman of Super Nintendo, you know, building teams together and kicking some butt. It counts, right? Well, not really, but I did win seven straight cups with the, the, the that, that team that plays south of us that used to play here because the Wild didn't exist yet, so I had to be a fan of somebody seven straight though <clears throat> so we'll get off of that right now but speed ah isn't that what we've always wanted around here especially see back in the 90s wasn't it just grit and clutch and grab and clutch and, and clutch and grit and clutch and clutch and crutch and then you know changes to the nhl and and 06 even the logo change and all that from that from the uh the orange to the silver look i kind of like the orange one better though that's just me like the orange nhl font yeah but we'll get off of that again. Um, but yeah, see, that got kind of tiring too. A lot of that early 2000s, late 90s, clutch, grab, slow, you know, two to one type of games compared to the 1980s where it was more of an open game with Gretzky, you know, and early 90s, the Gretzkys, the, the, the 80s Oilers. I mean, was there better hockey than that? Calgary Flames having that beautiful 1989 season and a very good 86 season where in both cases they wound up playing the Montreal Canadiens. They split those Stanley Cups, one for each, so good for them. Um, one of the cool parts about Evison, he played for the Hartford Whalers and everything, but obviously Hartford Whalers, that's a you know franchise I love very much. I have a lot of passion for the Hartford Whalers. It's a, it's a team, though, unfortunately, that 
Unfortunately, <clears throat> Dean Evison kind of took on the tendencies of the Hartford Whalers. You'll, you, you know, you can make the playoffs, you can be competitive, but then lose in the first round and then have another year. You know, maybe you're a little better, maybe you're about the same, and lose in the first round again. And then the next year you come back, oh, yeah, we made the playoffs again. We were, man, we're competitive. Is this the year? No, we lost in the first round again. Well, that's kind of Dean Evison's record, unfortunately, as a coach. Uh, obviously, he was an assistant for, and I'm not trying to bash and make fun of him. I'm just stating facts, unfortunately. Seven-year assistant with the Washington Capitals. Darby Hendrickson's been like, <laughs> gosh, 2010, right? Wasn't it 0910 when Todd Richards took over after Lemaire? That's how long Darby Hendrickson's been an assistant. But I guess, I mean, I'm happy for him, and he's like the coolest guy ever, so how could I root against him? Um, I'm Facebook friends with his brother, so that's nice. Uh, we haven't interacted or anything, but you know how Facebook is. You can, you know, bump into some people like that. Milwaukee Admirals head coach, first year, made the playoffs and all that. 41-28, and 28, lost in round one. Milwaukee Admirals, okay, this is all Milwaukee, okay, so I don't need to repeat that. 39-24, uh, and 24, lost in the first round. The next year, 33-28, again, further proof that being above 500 doesn't mean you're making the playoffs. So it's like it's not as easy as it used to be in professional hockey, out of playoffs. The next year, 40 Eight and 23. Did you hear that? 48 and 23. That's a pretty gaudy record. Lost in the first round. Uh, the next year, 43 and 26. Lost in the first round. The next year, 38 and 22. Out of playoffs. And then the next year, hired with, uh, hired when uh, uh, Paul Fenton took over as a potential uh, replacement to Bruce Boudreau. And he was Bruce Boudreau's replacement with a different general manager because Paul Fenton was fired in a calendar year because he well, made some really weird moves and was one of the biggest jackasses in professional sports history. And it's funny how the Timberwolves' new president of basketball operations was kind of the same. Um, his moves were pretty good most of the time, but he was, he was a jackass behind the scenes, and that sucks. Sometimes that's how it goes. It took a little longer for uh, the Wolves to kind of make the move there and for the uh, craziness to come to the uh, to come to a head or to come to the service, so to speak, with uh, what was his name? Guy Garrison, so I'm already forgetting his name. Gerson Rosas, what am I talking about? I got my mind on JFK here. I apologize. Jim Garrison. Wow. Anyhow, how did that, where did that come from? Dean Emerson, Minnesota Wild, well, lost in the qualifying round in 1920 as he took over from Bruce Boudreaux. The next year, 35 and 16. 35 and 16, lost in the first round. The next year, 53 and 22. That is 31 games above 500. These are incredible regular seasons. <coughs> Lost in the first round. You notice a trend? 22-23 <laughs> last year, not, not not nearly as good. It was like, it's a nice prime rib, but it's a little bit overcooked this time. You know, the last year was a big, juicy prime rib, and then I dropped it on the floor. So, uh, I dropped it on the floor after I ate, like, about half of it. God, it was the best prime rib of my life, and then I dropped it. Gosh! And then this one, just not quite as good, and I accidentally dropped it after getting about three-fourths through it. It wasn't nearly as good as the year before, but at least it was still good enough. <clears throat> lost in the first round. This year, 5, 10, and 4, or whatever the heck, and lost again. Or, excuse me, did not lose in the first round. They were probably going to miss the playoffs and all that with Dean Evison. So, um, probably. And that would have, a lot of us would have said that might have been okay because you want the higher draft pick. Keep on losing what the hell Hello, Johnny Menzel, you know, that kind of thing. I'm <laughs> Back in 2013 when the Vikings were awful and weird and nothing made any sense. Kind of like this year with the Wild, some of the weird signings and such just don't make a whole lot of sense. I don't know. Not quite as weird as Paul Fenton. <clears throat> Certainly a more entertaining human being in Bill Guerin's case rather than just, I am, uh, I, I don't want people talking about injuries and whoever uh, leaks that out. They're going to they're gonna lose their job. Yeah, whoever leaks out any type of conversation about it, it might have, the, the guy might have an ankle injury, you're going to lose your job. That was pretty much uh, Paul Fenton. <clears throat> Anyhow, I have ventured all over the place. You notice a slightly different theme to this show that I'm not talking about the games, really? Yeah. Well, I'm not going to a whole lot, especially the Detroit game, because it's just, well, it, it's a different show today. And I don't know, sometimes the game reviews get rep repetitious anyway. John Hines? I don't know. It's because there was a guy named Joe Hines that had kind of a raspy voice like that years ago that I used to work with. Uh, he was like boss number two, basically. One of the coolest guys I ever met. But unfortunately, I didn't get to work with him very long because uh, it was a short little job. I ended up moving on. 
to, I guess you could call it bigger and better things. I went from making six bucks an hour to doing a lawn service with my brother, which was closer to 15 in the mid nineties. That's a pretty big jump. I'll digress now where I need to be. John Hines never played in the National Hockey League, but he did play for <clears throat> Boston University. Does that, does that sound familiar? Boston College and Boston University. Boston, from Warwick, Rhode Island. Warwick, Rhode Island, guys. Guys. Yeah, he's got to keep, keep the puck, uh, get the puck on net. So it's like right away, I, I had no idea where John Hines was from. I always assumed just kind of Canada. He kind of, you know, that shaved head, maybe he's just Canadian. You know, get the shoot the puck, eh? You know, that kind of thing. Kind of like Dean Everson, obviously, from Thompson, Manitoba. And then, and then you hear it, John Hines, you know, got to get the puck on that. You know, we got to focus on speed and uh, commitment, commitment. And it's like, he's from he's from Boston, isn't he? He's from New England or Boston or whatever. Rhode Island, it's like close enough. They're basically Bostonians in their own way. So you're going to hear me imitating him with Boston accents and all that. That put a smile on my face too, but also it's like that figures. Where's uh, Bill Guerin from? So it's kind of, <laughs> and these guys go way back. They were, they were like, you know, they, they'd go have a couple of beers and all that going back to his days with uh, him being Bill Guerin with the New Jersey Devils when he was holding out in a contract, which is kind of funny. Bill Guerin holding out. <laughs> it is kind of funny how, you know, two different sides of the equation here can, uh, yeah, it's funny how you can be on both sides of the equation there. But, um, oh, it's hilarious. You know, they don't need... Okay, he was a wing. Him being John Hines. Yep, didn't get a whole lot of points. 34 games as a uh, sophomore. Four goals, six assists in 34 games. So, yep. But we're not hearing about grit. We're hearing about speed. Amen, hallelujah. But, uh, no, they were drinking, buddy. Or, you know, not drinking necessarily, but, you know, had a couple of beers. I don't know if they're, like, the go-get-drunk and all that crap. But some people probably assume that. So, I don't know, you build relationships with people. He was an assistant coach way back then and all that. Uh, with the, There's no information about it, though. I don't get it. He must have been working with the Devils, but not like in a... Yeah, that's weird. Some of this I don't really understand a whole lot. Um, he must have met him. Yeah, he said he was an assistant with them. So, I don't know, he must have been working with the Devils kind of on the side. Kind of like a kind of behind-the-scenes kind of guy. Uh, so there was that, I guess. That's how he met him. It looks like he was more of like a, with the, uh, he was with UMass as an assistant, University of Wisconsin for a couple of years. Um, and then, uh, well, there's some good news here. Now, because when you look at, uh, John Hines' playoff record as an NHL coach, he got out of the first round, out of the first round, his first, or out, I mean, out of the playoffs his first two years with the Devils. Not so good, because it wasn't a really good team after they, after Zach Greasy left for a while. You know, they had their cute little run as a uh, Cinderella finalist, just like the Kings, but the Kings were definitely the better team. Um, New Jersey in 17, 18, lost in round one after a pretty promising year, 44 and 29, and then out of playoffs, and he was replaced during the middle of the year and wound up with the Nashville Predators, who also, or, or excuse me, who he replaced in um, Nashville. He replaced, uh, I believe it was LaViolette, who took the Devils to the, or the Predators to the final few years back against the Penguins and lost in the qualifying round just like uh, Dean Evison and lost in the first round the next two years and was out of the playoffs last season and a coaching change was made and now he's come in during the middle of the year here or early parts of the year anyway to replace Dean Evison him being John Hines so he has never advanced out of the first round in the NHL but at least in the AHL he Advanced every single year he made the playoffs with uh, Wilkes, Barrow, uh, Scranton, Penguins. That's where the relationship built more so because uh, Bill Guerin, in the later stages of that time, was the assistant general manager uh, with the Pittsburgh Penguins, which means he was working directly with John Hines, the head coach of the Wilkes, Bear, Scranton, Penguins. Again, that's the AHL affiliate to the Pittsburgh Penguins. The first year, John Hines lost in the second round. The next year, he lost in the second round. The next year, he lost in the third round. The next year, he lost in the third round and lost in the second round the year after. So, again, failed in the postseason. Ultimately, didn't win championships, and you're not going to win them every year. But no championship, no finals appearances. <clears throat> Did get to the conference final twice. Got to the division round three times. So, at least he's had some postseason success on his coaching record. And it's not, uh, and it's not a peewee league in, uh, you know, Rhode Island somewhere. 
Nope, it's in the AHL. It's still professional hockey. Younger players and all that. So maybe he can have success with the younger players of Minnesota. And, well, maybe speed will work better with the younger players in Minnesota. A speed style rather than a grit style and all that. Um, and that also might mean uh, we might not be worshipping uh, Freddie Goudreau quite as much here now, hopefully. Nobody's really rooting against Freddie Goudreau. He's a good guy. Uh, he's a great shootout. <laughs> he's a great shootout weapon. But so was uh, Eric Christensen, who did nothing in the NHL. So he was the best shootout guy ever, basically, at the time. The Oil traded for him. It was kind of funny back in the uh, later stages of the Chuck the Schmuck. No, I'm just kidding. There's a different Chuck the Schmuck. It's not him. You fill in the blank there. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> Up Chuck Fletcher is the nickname he has. Um <laughs> <laughs> of Chuck Fletcher in the later, uh, yeah, with the Wild acquired Eric Christensen, yay. Um, I'm beginning to wonder, that's actually further back, isn't it? I have no idea what I'm talking about anymore. I think that might have been really early in the Up Chuck Fletcher era, not the later stages. Yeah, because the shootout's been around a very long time now. Doug Risebrow was still the GM. Dumpster Doug. But at least John Hines has advanced. So I remember somebody the other day said, oh, he, he never advanced in the uh, AHL either, just like Dean Everson. Incorrect. He advanced every single season. John Hines advanced every single season. Now, it's many years ago, unfortunately, but it is what it is. At least he did advance, though. It, it counts. It still counts. The Cubs did win the World Series in 1908. That still counts, right? Okay, sorry. That's a little bit crazy. That's your great-great-grandpa right there. <laughs> for you Chicagoans that just might be listening, some Blackhawk fans or transplants that moved to Chicago and uh, are still Wild fans, I don't know. Um, God, what a gaudy record, though. It kind of sucks that they lost in the second round, that uh, AHL Penguins, the, the first year that uh, um, Hines took over, 58-21, and 21, but lost in the second round. I don't know, so it is still kind of disappointing. But similar records to Dean Everson in the regular season, at the AHL level. Kind of, you know, low 40s, mid 40s, but the 58? Dude, what happened? They should have won the championship, but maybe somebody got hurt or got called up or something. Um, it couldn't have been Crosby. <laughs> Crosby was in the NHL at age 18. So, and that was years ago before that. So he started, uh, Hines went from 2010 to 2015 and then ultimately got hired by the New Jersey Devils the following year. So he it was literally like a promotion, obviously, like, this guy's a really good AHL coach, like a really promising AHL coach, and he was young at the time, obviously. He's 48 now, which is still relatively young. Uh, that would have made him 30... Uh, 39. So, yeah, like kind of like Mike Yo when he took over the Wild. Um, unfortunately, again, no advancement in the postseason and some out-of-playoffs years, but New Jersey was kind of... They weren't really good for a while. And Nashville was kind of weird and kind of a mess. You know, it seemed like in both cases he took him over he'd taken over for somebody who was more successful before him, unfortunately. And then the team was kinda aging and moving on and, you know, free agency, all that cute stuff. Both teams had made a finals run a few years before. I ironically. Um and Nashville definitely had success and they were tough to play against. They've always been a pain in the butt to play against and I do remember seeing that uh, shaved head guy over there in the uh <clears throat> Over there on the, on the side there with the, uh, the, uh, over there in the bench with the, um, <laughs> Nashville Predator. So he's a very familiar guy. The name didn't ring a bell right away, but then I saw him like, oh yeah, he looks very familiar. And it's like, okay, yeah. You know, like not like super familiar, like, like maybe a Colorado coach or something, you know, obviously not a Patrick Wall or the current guy who won the cup with them just now. Uh, the St. Louis coach, obviously great career, uh, well, he was kind of like a miracle worker with a St. Louis team that was massively underachieving in 1819, ever uh, acquiring Ryan O'Reilly. Everybody thought St. Louis has a chance to do something now. And then they were like the worst team in the league. They made coaching change. And then uh, from a guy named Mike Yo to uh, <laughs> the new guy. And then, uh, well, cup champions. Isn't that crazy? Of course, the St. Louis coach is Craig Baruby, and yes, he did replace Mike Yo. So, kind of like moving around on the fly here. My apologies. Just wanted to make absolutely sure. Uh, yeah, and and that's what I thought had happened. He'd replaced Mike Yo, and then took the team to a Stanley Cup championship. Craig Baruby was, of course, a <clears throat> gritty player and all that. He played for many years in the NHL. He was uh, he was kind of closer to Everson in a lot of ways, but even man, even crazier. Like 300 penalty minutes and. Uh, 
93-94 with the Washington Capitals. 305 penalty minutes. 300 and... Okay, yeah, you get the idea. Played all the way up to 0203 with the Flames, who went to the Cup Final the next year and then became a coach as years moved on. Assistant coach with the Philadelphia Phantoms. Even coached the... Uh, yeah, he was a head coach with Philadelphia for like a year and a half. Well, two years. And interesting. And they just decided, I guess, not to keep him. That kind of thing. He was like a, a interim, basically, who lasted like a, eh, about two years. And then uh, resurfaced as an associate head coach with Mike Yo of the uh, St. Louis Blues and all that good stuff. And he's still a head coach since. He's only advanced out of the first round once since then. That's just kind of interesting. So we'll see how things go with Craig Barubi. Obviously crazy guy, but hopefully John Hines has some success here that are similar. It's ridiculous that they're not showing his record in uh, 1819. I don't understand. This is Hockey Database, so shame on you, Hockey Database. You're my friends, dang it. Why would you leave out that part? So, I don't know. But we all know what happened. St. Louis was the worst team in the league. That's the bottom line. They were the worst team in the league with really good players, well, promising pieces and all that. They were underachieving massively. Took over, uh, Craig Berube takes over and... St. Louis just goes nuts the rest of the way, and John, uh, Jordan Bington was the uh, miracle success story, and has pretty much been kind of eh, a little inconsistent and crazy ever since. Um, we did see some nice pace of play from the Minnesota Wild, so we'll just wrap up with St. Louis of all teams, Craig Barubi. Or Barubi. So Barubi, hopefully you can pass on some of that magic to John Hines here. John Hines' first game as a Minnesota Wild coach, Craig Barubi. On the other sideline, hopefully you can pass on some of that ma- magic here on no- Tuesday, November the 28th, which was the game. 3-1 to victory for Minnesota, ending a seven-game winless streak. Uh, again, after the hapless loss, Matt Boldy looked like uh, he looked like the kind of guy that might actually do something in this league again, scoring his <coughs> second goal of the season. Now, if the son of Ann Frederick Goudreau scoring his first goal of the season, Freddie, how ironic. Freddie Goudreau scores his first goal of the season. Matt Boldy scores his second. Again, Boldy needs to stay healthy along with the fact of the whole Charlie Coyle kind of Casper the Friendly Ghost bullcrap. I can still remember Casper the Friendly uh, Coyle scoring his second goal against Calgary. You know, I have a weird memory. About two months into the season, and he he didn't even celebrate because it's like, yeah, it's about bleeping time. Jeez, I finally scored something. He was just kind of looking down like, yeah, all right, good. I scored. I'm I'm glad. Like, it's about freaking time. And it was a really low-scoring game, and it was during the Mike Yo era, of course, and it was actually right around when the Wild were ending their losing streak and playing, you know, more of a defensive-minded game, winning games 2-1, to one, which might end up happening, but at the same time, this team looked like they could have blown out the Blues. They were just, you know, weren't finishing on a couple of uh, golden opportunities, that's all, but, yeah, that sounds familiar, too, but, but the defense was there, and Gus looked really good, like, way better. Looks like the goalie that uh, could help your fantasy team go all the way and uh, all that as a free agent because the other guy got impatient with him and dumped him. And then I quickly uh, made a move on Marc-Andre Fleury to acquire Philip Gustafson, and that was beautiful. Um, I did not draft Marc-Andre Fleury. The computer did. (laughs) Not that I wouldn't have necessarily, but uh, I'd rather have Gustafson than Marc-Andre Fleury. Let's just put it that way. Uh, You know what I mean? So it's that kind of thing. I let the thing do the auto-draft like with the rest of the league and then make tons of moves during the course of the year ultimately leading to hopefully something magical. Uh, Rossi's been quiet a little bit lately. Goudreau finally came out of his, uh, well, for at least for one game anyway. We'll see how he turns out. He was the best face-off guy in the game. A lot of uh, the face-offs, the Wild were pretty much butt-kicked in that category, except for Goudreau. Nine, and, nine wins, seven losses. That's pretty impressive, actually. <sighs> Brodeen had a very, very strong game, strong performance, including uh, setting up... Uh, Matt Boldy for the game icing goal. Not the game winning goal, but the game icing goal to make it 3-1 to one all by himself. Was able to finish on Jordan Bennington for a 3-1 to one victory. Uh, Jonas Berdeen with five shots on goal. And of course, he's been playing some good, strong, solid defense since. So Brock Faber will not, Brock Faber will not be getting the Mike Madonna Award for this episode. It's going to be his, uh, it's going to be his pair, his defensive pair mate. That would be Jonas Berdeen. Jonas Berdeen has been the best player for the while, at least the past week or so. Maybe I'm crazy, Maybe I'm, but he's having a really strong season. Maybe I'm missing something, but Jules Erickson X should also be right right up there. He's like the other strong candidate for it. It's definitely not Boldy. It's definitely not Marcus Johansson, who continues to be invisible. He's the candidate for... In fact, I'm going to probably give it to him here in a second. 
yeah, I let the cat out of the bag there. But um, Goligoski got to play with with Bogosian. That's that's okay. It, it is what it is. At least they, you know, they hey, they, <laughs> they were part of a team keeping the uh, <laughs> keeping the wild off the board. Though unfortunately, Bogosian and Goligoski were on the ice when the goal was scored. The, uh, the St. Louis goal was scored. So okay, sorry guys, but it's the way it is. You know, <laughs> some I won't sing the song right now, but. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> but the uh, Madonna Award is going to go to Jonas Brodeen. The James Shepard Memorial Popcorn Maker funny stuff is going to go to Marcus Johansson for being continuously invisible. Continuously invisible. Kirill Kaprizov did score against uh, Colorado, but really since then hasn't done a whole lot. He hasn't been all that great. Uh, been pretty quiet. And then that 4-1 to one hapless depressing loss reeked of like it, it reeked of the wild losing to boston and mike yo was fired uh the boudreaux one i remember the wild won that game didn't they so and the, the wild were kind of coming off like not playing so hot they were there they were starting to play better and then but maybe it was bill Guerin's similar thought process of they're you know the swagger is not going to really come back this is just we're just going to stay kind of average to below average to maybe slightly above and we're not going to go anywhere so let's make a move here and uh, he brings in his, his uh, guy who's been around a while and uh, that he's known for many years anyway and has done something in the NHL. Nothing spectacular, uh, but obviously had pretty good success in the AHL. Hopefully someday that'll translate to the National Hockey League and help this team have some playoff success and build up some confidence. And maybe we can uh, trade away some of these veterans. Somehow, some way, they'll waive their no-move clause and Go play for the uh, Detroit Red Wings. They're going to win the cup before we do. <laughs> no, probably. <laughs> or uh, wherever. You know, Tampa to try to make a late run. Uh, to try to make another run here later in their careers and such. So, Bogosian. Yep, uh, we have a lot of former Tampa players. At least we, we have had a, a couple come and go here. Patrick Maroon with a uh, three-peat. We got to see him holding the cup in the background here. That's on the TV, the, the TV in the background. And obviously Bogosian was a part of that franchise as well. So, I mean, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. It's it's fun to have guys that won the Cup before, but it doesn't guarantee anything. It, it can help in the locker room, but it doesn't necessarily turn the tide. I mean, if guys just aren't that good, they're just not that good. If guys are hurt every 10 minutes, they're hurt every 10 minutes. Uh, that type of thing. But, I don't know. Um, I like to hear the word speed more than grit. Always have, for the most part. It's good to have some grit. There, I said the word. Damn it. But <laughs> it's good to have some. But if that's kind of like, I don't know, it just felt like sometimes it's like that's all you care about. Let's uh, let's kind of be more aggressive. Let's get some speed out there. That's how the Penguins won the cup over the Sharks and the National Predators and other teams as well over the, like, you know, Tampa, obviously. Vegas was faster, bigger, and stronger than everybody last year, basically, when it mattered most. So it's kind of a combination of size and speed that can help you win a cup. And the Wild have some size, but I don't know, not, not as much as other teams, I suppose. Good thing Jules Erickson is a pretty big guy, and he has 11 goals now. So amazing run for him. He's actually probably the best player overall on the Wild right now. He's tied with Kirill Kaprizov in points. He's got 11 goals versus Kirill's six. Um, Zuccarillo has got 17 assists, but I'm going to keep saying it. It feels like empty stats at times. They're nice to have. They're very nice. Nice to have the assists, his passing ability, and the occasional clutch goal, which is wonderful. But at the same time, it kind of feels like empty stats at times. You're not really seeing a whole lot. Marcus Johansson, one bleeping goal in 20 games, eight total points. Again, kind of like, a, I don't know what to say about that. I just, I'm, it's not good. It's not good enough. It's not good enough at all. Uh, Boldy, again, kind of Charlie Coyle-like, but at least a few assists along the way, which is cute and everything. Patrick Maroon has more points than Matt Boldy. Patrick Maroon has more points than Matt Boldy. Boldy did miss seven games, but that's another thing. Stop missing time, damn it. I mean, obviously injuries happen. It's a freak sport. Crazy things can go, can go wrong. But with Boldy, it seems like it's too frequent, man. So there's a bit of that. Uh, and then, of course, oh, and Ryan Hartman's the other guy who should get the uh, popcorn maker for the, the trip. The trip that could have injured uh, Debrinkat. It was intentional. It was stupid. If you disagree with me, I, I don't know, man. It was intentional and it was stupid. What are you doing? Like, did you see where his skate went? It went all the way across the guy. I mean, <laughs> it was so obvious. You'd have to be crazy to say it wasn't intentional. 
He was trying to sneak it in when no one's looking. Whoop! Like it was with his skate. He tripped him with his skate. But like from, see, he was to the, you know, if he didn't see it, uh, Ryan Hartman was to the left of Debrincat. His skate. Ryan Hartman's went all the way to the right side of Debrincat's uh, right right skate, all the way. Like we're talking an ultra trip here. We're not just oh, a little nudgy, nudgy, nudgy. You know, oh, it was a mistake, nudge, nudge. No, it was super intentional. And what are you doing, man? So two game suspension for a repeat offender. So he obviously is a popcorn maker, memorial type of guy as well. With that said, we'll take a quick break, and we're going to preview the upcoming games where John Hines will continue to be coach of the Minnesota Wild now. back here on Brave the Wild, segment number two. We're going to preview three games up and coming, but first, we're going to hear from DraftKings right here and now. Bet the action on the ice with DraftKings Sportsbook. Check out the Sharks and Boston Bruins game. Gee, I think the Bruins are favored by a little bit. (laughs) The Bruins are minus 485. The Sharks plus 370. Detroit-Chicago, that's a classic, classic matchup back in the day in the Norris division. I kind of, you know, I miss the Red Wings now. Dang it. I miss them. Red Wings, minus 225, of course. Yep, they should be favored. Uh, Montreal Canadiens in Florida. Yep, Florida's favored, minus 1225. New Jersey Devils, minus 142 over Philadelphia. That's a cool matchup. That's a fun matchup because Philly's definitely better than last year. Pittsburgh and Tampa, epic stuff. Tampa, minus 142 to Pittsburgh's plus 120. Seattle, Kraken. They're getting Kraken, but they're not as good as I thought they were going to be. They're a plus 184. Uh, 154, sorry. Well, that's what threw me off. It's t- Toronto's minus 185. New York Islanders plus 164. Carolina Hurricanes minus 198. That's my cup champion. The Wilder Underdogs versus Nashville plus 105. Nashville is minus 125. So it's kind of a close one there. Buffalo and St. Louis, they're both minus. Okay, that's an interesting one. St. Louis, yeah, I, I, yeah, well, I'm not supposed to. <laughs> I would think Buffalo should be the better team here, but I guess they're favoring St. Louis by the slightest margin, minus 118 versus minus 102. Edmonton Oilers, minus 120 over the Jets, plus 100. Colorado Avalanche heavy favorites with the Arizona Coyotes, minus uh, 205 to plus 170. Calgary plus one one fourteen over a, a Dallas Stars team, but they played pretty good against Dallas. Has Calgary minus one thirty five in that case. Vegas who's struggling all of a sudden. This is the game of the night, no doubt. Uh, otherwise, first really quick, uh, Washington and Anaheim even. Washington and Anaheim even at one ten each. Interesting, but Vegas versus Vancouver. Wow, Vancouver's favorite because Vegas is not playing too well. Um, yeah. Minus 118 versus minus 102. Vegas, um, yeah, Vancouver, absolutely. um, (laughs) Vancouver definitely having an awesome year with Rick Tockett, and that's kind of a comparable as well. Rick Tockett taking over for Bruce Boudreaux where things looking more aggressive, more speed, and more commitment coming forward. So hopefully that wasn't a very sorry attempt at reading some of the betting lines and such, uh, uh, available lines and odds and such. So download the app now and use code THPN. That's the Hockey Podcast Network. New customers can get 150 bucks instantly in bonus bets for betting just $5 in hockey. Isn't that cool? That's code THPN. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NHL. The crown is yours because we are DraftKings. <laughs> bonus bets expire 168 hours after insurance. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-H-O-P. So it's like HOPE, HOPE, and Y, basically, all in one word. Or text HOPE, and Y, all one word, all caps. 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888 
1-800-289-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort, 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after insurance. See dkng.com slash hockey for eligible and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gambling resources. NHL and the NHL Shield, that's right, the NHL Shield are registered trademarks of the National Hockey League. Copyright NHL 2023, all rights reserved. So, yes, thank you so much, DraftKings, for the sponsorship. Really appreciate the partnership with DraftKings on the Hockey Podcast Network, and thank you Dylan and Kyle for having me on board, coming in out of British Columbia, around Vancouver there. So, where are we? I forgot. I forgot. No, we're previewing three games. Starting off with Nashville, ESPN+, Plus, but everything's on ESPN+, Plus, which is a good thing. I'm very happy. Bridgestone Arena, a road game for the Minnesota Wild. Nashville is 11-10. and 10. The Wild are 6, 10-4. and 4. <laughs> Coming off a of victory over the St. Louis, St. Louis, uh, crappy team, I guess. No, I don't know. The St. Louis Blues. Suspension for Ryan Hartman. Michael Milne and Caden Bank here are both on injured reserve. They're both uh, supposed to be with Iowa, but they've been out since uh, early October. Cody Glass. What's he doing there? Former uh, Vegas Golden Knight. Injured reserve. No, uh, November 21st. Tommy Novak. Injured reserve on the 14th of November. Okay, so... Minnesota Wilder, 26th in goals. Nashville is 9th. Goals against the Wilder, 26th. Again, sounds familiar. 18th in goals against for the National Predators. And so on and so forth. This is a four-game series. This one's in Nashville. The next one's in Minnesota on January. Well, St. Paul, whatever. The X. January, Thursday, January 25th. Thursday, February 29th, because it's that leap year and presidential election and all that cute stuff. Nashville there. Interesting. So a rare February 29th game. Sunday, March the 10th, in XL Energy Center. Well, we'll hopefully sweep or at least win the Series 3-1, to which didn't happen very often. It's been a headache of a matchup over the years. Philip Forsberg's always been a pain in the butt to play against. Try to move forward here. I apologize. Yeah, Jose, Jose Soros goes against the average just under 3. Save percentage right at 90 and one shut out on the season. Kevin Lankinen, wasn't he on the Blackhawks before? Uh, Ryan O'Reilly, that's right, Ryan O'Reilly only 19 points, 10 assists and 9 goals for Ryan O'Reilly, Philip Forsberg with 27 points, he'd be the leading scorer in the wild for sure, Ryan O'Reilly all 21 games, at least they've been playing, um, Forsberg though 12 goals, 15 assists, he's definitely been the best player for them, at least on the offensive side, obviously Roman Josie is the best of them all, uh, elite defenseman 4 goals, 12 assists obviously stuff that doesn't always show up in the uh, score sheet and such, of course, especially in hockey. I mean, it's not like guys are scoring every night, unless your name is Wayne Gretzky back in the day. Um, Nashville's been playing like uh, Wayne Gretzky and the Edmonton Oilers lately. They are 5-0 in their last five, including an 8-1 demolition derby. Close to Thanksgiving there. Uh, my goodness, was that Black Friday last week? 8-3 to over St. Louis, just like Minnesota lost 8-3 to to Dallas. So Nashville's been playing pretty good. 3-2 uh, to two win over Pittsburgh. Too bad they couldn't do that in the final years ago. 3-2 victory over the Winnipeg Jets. I think that was the conference final that year, wasn't it? It's a pretty good Jets team, but then after that, they quickly weakened a bit. Or was that the year Vegas got to the final? I don't know. Winnipeg got to the conference final once and lost in five games. I, that's all I need to know at this point. I want to call, call this a winnable game, and it should be. It should be. It's crazy to think, man, they are barely above 500, and this is after a pretty good win streak here. Um, Nashville's been rolling lately, but at the same time, hmm, at the same time, I don't know. Um, can the Wild overcome? Can the Wild be the team to end the uh, the Nashville winning streak? Can they be the ones? It would kind of be fitting, uh, the, the former coach getting to go against his team. I'm going to I'm gonna step out in faith and believe the Minnesota Wild win a 3-2, to 4-2, to two, maybe with an empty netter type of a closey. Let's say 3-2 to two victory for the Minnesota Wild over the National Predators. They're going to end the Predators winning streak and win two in a row with John Hines as head coach of the Minnesota Wild. It's not going to be any crazy, crazy performance, but I'm believing the Wild beat the Nashville Predators somehow, some way. Not that Nashville's that great, but that they've, you know, they've been red hot lately. 
But I think the Wild Overcome and Gustafson continues his streak. He's been playing pretty good since uh, Sweden, so it's it's encouraging. His numbers still are horrendous. 88.6 save percentage and a sash. One shutout on the year. Goals against average of 368. But that thing will get down below 3 at some point. A very bold prediction, right? I'm going to step out in faith and believe that Gustafson is going to get his goals against average below 3 at some point this season. Maybe, God willing, by uh, before the end of the calendar year. That'd be great if that could happen. But the Wild win 3-2 to two over Nashville. Most likely guy to score in the game is going to be Ro- uh, Marco Rosti is going to get his 7th goal of the season. And that would be wonderful if he was going to be able to do so. Uh, Chicago. The Wild will be playing like a team that I'm, a city that I've been talking about off and on of late. The Chicago Blackhawks to open up the month of December on the 3rd. So the Wild don't play until Monday after tonight. So quite a quite a bit of time off. Friday, Saturday. Enjoy those nights, guys. Bond with your coach or whatever. This is a 1 o'clock Sunday game. The Minnesota Vikings do not play, so we can put all our focus on this one if we want to. And all that good stuff. Taylor Hall, injured reserve as of November 18th. ACL surgery in his right knee. Ah, that's too bad. That's too bad. It is. Gosh, ACL surgery in his right knee. At least they tell you what's going on a little bit. Mm, I'm sorry, Taylor. Yeah, he was that veteran addition to the Blackhawks. That's demoralizing, I got to think. You know, that you know he's working with Connor Bedard. You know, this is our first, first ever real matchup against Connor. Jared Denorti, the Blackhawks have placed him on injured reserve, son of Mark Denorti. Andreas, see, that's the, these are depressing, man. Injured reserve always means like a long time, at least potentially. Andreas Athanasu, injured reserve as of November 9th. Chicago's 20, or excuse me, 30th in goals, despite the hottest prospect in hockey. 23rd in goals against. Again, this is a, no, this is a three-game series, so a little different situation here, even though we are in the same division. Sunday, December the 3rd, Wednesday, February 7th, and Sunday, April the 7th, the Blackhawks have won a single game. Uh, they are 2-3 and three in their last five, but they did win their most recent one versus the Seattle Kraken, interestingly enough. They did beat Toronto recently, which is kind of impressive, but a 7-3 loss highlights the, the negative side of things when it comes to the Chicago Blackhawks in recent play. Oh, I didn't look at the special teams with Nashville. I'm going to back up really quick. Obviously, our special teams are still horrendous, but definitely better, uh, well, much better showing versus the Blues. My apologies here. Uh, Nashville power play is 16th, the Wilds 24th. The Wilds still have the worst penalty kill in hockey. Nashville's is 29th, so they stink there as well, so on and so forth. So we're going to go back to Chicago now and their special team situation. I just, yeah, I had to get that out there. And then one more game review coming up, and we'll look at the pool specs. The Blackhawks penalty, uh, power play is 30th again, so not a whole lot of promise going on right now. Connor Bedard's kind of out on an island. 30th on the power play. The Wild are 24th. The Wild have the worst penalty kill. Chicago's is 21st. 21st. Let's look at the players a little bit. Oh, and by the way, former Chicago Blackhawk legend Patrick Kane has signed with the Detroit Red Wings. So Patrick Kane will skate with the Red Wings. And they're calling him an old man and all that stuff. It's like, okay, that's great. Whatever. You know, <laughs> he's still Patrick Kane, obviously. He's not as good as he used to be, but, ah, come on. I don't know. I'm not big on calling people old man and stuff. Uh, Peter Mrezik, well, he's he's a, he, he's a fantasy goalie. He's definitely not a main guy, but he's, he's okay. He has his Knights, 3.22, save percentage of 906. No shutouts on the year, 5-6 and six overall. And he's kind of platooning with uh, Soderblom there, Arvid Soderblom. But Mrazek, a little better. Uh, Sutterblum is 3.78 in goals against average. Connor Bedard leads the Chicago Blackhawks in goals and points. And after him, it's like, this guy did that and that guy did this. It's not a whole lot to talk about. And you have 90-year-old veterans. Uh, Taylor Hall was a 90-year-old veteran too, but at least pretty established guy with an ACL surgery. Depressing, man. Connor Bedard, Connor Bedard, Bedard 10 goals. Seven assists, 17 points, and he's a brand new rookie. He'll be going against Patrick Kane in Detroit. Interesting. Interesting. That would be tonight. Patrick Kane against his former team. How appropriate is that? That's kind of cool. I like it. Then they'll play Winnipeg and then Minnesota. That will be in Excel Energy Center. Notable guys, of course. Yep, Taylor Hall wasn't exactly putting up the points and anything, but there's just not a whole lot going on in Chicago. The Wild need to build a win streak here. 
I mean, you've got to beat the Blackhawks. Maybe we lose to Nashville, but you've got to be able to beat this team. Seriously, you've got to. What, what's going on? Like, Ryan Donato is their third leading scorer, or fourth leading scorer. And I know people locally and on other podcasts, Ryan Donato, oh, oh they, the Wild screwed him over. And uh, did, did they? Did they, though? Was, was Ryan Donato that good? What, really? Like, was he that good? Like, he's probably better than maybe some of the credit he was getting. Ah, come on, man. <laughs> Four goals, six assists, ten points. I mean, he's like a 40-point guy at best, isn't he? Maybe 50 if, like, a really magical little season. Everything kind of goes right and he stays healthy and doesn't get scratched. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Um, Philip, but yeah, I know scratching sometimes is unfortunate. Philip Kurosev, four goals, eight assists, 12 points. He's the most productive guy along with Connor Bedard because he missed six games. Corey Perry, the ancient big giant uh, Stanley Cup champion of the Anaheim Ducks <laughs> 16 years ago. <laughs> when he was super young, really, really young, won the Stanley Cup and been to multiple, been to three Cup finals in a row up until, and he's not going this year, that's for damn sure, uh, up until last year, I believe it was, where that streak ended and I lost them all. Ugh. Tyler Johnson, former member of the Tampa Bay Lightning, again, you're trying to bring that Cup energy and that finals and all that? Yeah, okay. It doesn't always translate to the, to the team you're on. Seth Jones, Yep, Seth Jones, eight assists on the year. Another older guy who's been a huge disappointment, actually, with the Blackhawks. But pretty much everybody has been. You wish them the best and all that, but it's it's not going so hot yet. It'll it'll come around, though. I mean, the Blackhawks were pretty lousy the first couple of years. Patrick Kane was there, and then all of a sudden they were like Stanley Cup contenders, and then they won three out of, like, five or something. It was like, ugh. It was not fun to watch because, boy, things changed very quickly there. <laughs> It escalated very quickly. The Wilds should be able to win comfortably. Like a, I, I, I want to believe the Wild are going to win the game 4-1. to one. It's going to be like the opposite of the Detroit game. The Wild are by far the better team and beat the Chicago Blackhawks. And some people might be laughing right now. Like, where's all this faith coming from? Are you crazy? Get, get out of town, Joey. Oh, don't worry. There's a certain team the Wild pretty much never beat coming up. So, don't worry. Don't worry, we're not going undefeated or anything. We, we never beat these guys, especially in their house. Tuesday, the 5th of December, the Wild head to Calgary, Alberta. Scotiabank settled home with, uh, I keep forgetting the stupid guy's name. I keep forgetting the horse's name. <laughs> Blasty. I was like, yeah, that's what it is. It's why it came back earlier this time. Blasty. <laughs> keep forgetting. So uh, hopefully they're not wearing Blasty jerseys, even though they're, they're kind of cool. They're better than they were the first go-round. The first go-round, it was like, Ugh. Three game series of this team. Of course, we've not played them once this year. Tuesday, December the 5th, Thursday, December the 14th, and Tuesday, January 2nd. So it's going to go very quickly versus the Calgary Flames. They are playing better lately. They do have a new coach. It's been a frustrating kind of an up and down season. Uh, they're 3 and 2 in their last five. They are playing better, especially that 7 to 4 demolition versus Dallas. That's impressive, actually. Quite impressive. And they're playing them again tonight. Uh, so we'll see what happens there. Um, three and two of it's been win, loss, win, loss, win, loss. Or should win, basically, in the last five games. Obviously, the Wild had our massive losing streak and all that. So on and so forth. Calgary's 19th in goals, 22nd in goals against. 27th on the power play, 12th on the penalty kill. So on, so on, and so on. Kristinev, face. Face. What, he's, what, he's ugly or what? No, he probably had a facial laceration or something. November the 29th. I might have a face issue, but that's that's personal, damn it. How dare you? Why do you think I'm only on radio? I'm not going on no YouTube. Leave me alone. I'm not doing it. Sorry. Oliver Clinton, injured reserve. October 9th. Kevin Rooney, injured reserve. October the 5th. So, always sad to see those because you're not, yeah, I mean, colossal injuries. It sucks, man. I don't like to think about that kind of stuff. The Wild are not going to beat Calgary. They, they just won't because we never do. It's just the way it is. Some things never change, except the first season or so in the Wild existence, we dominated Calgary. They were last place, we were second last, and it was a fun, fun, magical time having the Minnesota Wild. You can sense the smile on my face. Uh, Minnesota Wild and NHL hockey back in Minnesota. I mean, it was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful time, and it was fun. We were actually beating Calgary and all that. How the North Stars always struggled against them. And it took about a year or two, and then Calgary started beating us. It was like 500, and then uh, the year after that, it's like ever since, pretty much. Calgary's pretty much, uh, you know, not completely owned the Wild, but uh, let's just say we've they've had we've had minimal success against them versus other teams out there. 
It's a team that's absolutely stacked with talent, but they have underachieved in a massive way, uh, starting last year, but now this year too. It's not necessarily Daryl Sutter's fault. Well, I don't think he helped necessarily either. Obviously he didn't, but it's continuing. Um, it's continuing, unfortunately. Elias Lindholm is the leading scorer overall with a, me- with a measly 15 points, not, uh, ten, uh, five goals, 10 assists. Nazim Kadri, the great, great free agent addition that's going to going to take him to the cup championship. Four goals, 10 assists, 14 points. I mean, he's, he's decent, but I don't know. Uh, Mangiapani, a guy you don't really think of as your third leading scorer. He's more of, isn't he more of like a, a middle six kind of guy with a little bit of uh, speed and such. Huberdeau should be your your star or second best player. 13 points in 22 games is four goals. Four goals. Your leading goal scorer on Calgary, Blake Coleman with six goals. Blake Coleman. Yeah. Who now? Um, yeah, it's Blake Coleman. Six goals. Yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome. Gosh, almost halfway, a uh, little, gosh, he's more than halfway to Erickson Eck level. So, it's awesome. Which years ago would have been extremely laughable. Wigger, yep, obviously a wonderful player, but hasn't been wonderful with Calgary. Half a point a game. Michael Backlund, you know, he's like the, he's like the leader of the team. And I don't know, what is that? What good is that at this point? Jacob Markstrom, I swear, ever since that stupid Dallas series, when it's like, how much? <laughs> Ever since that stupid Dallas series, or especially, I don't know, Edmonton series, not Dallas, that stupid Edmonton series, Jacob Markstrom went from maybe a top three goalie in hockey to uh, the guy in Vancouver who was mediocre at best. You know, remember that guy who was giving up about three goals a game? Yeah, it's Jacob Markstrom now, 2.93, save percentage 90. No shutouts, 5-7 and seven on the year. <sighs> Vladar doesn't bring you much better, though he is 4-2. They've scored a little more when he's been in net, but save percentage of 88? That's that's balls. 3.2 goals against average? Blizzard of balls. Dustin Wolf, well, he was dusted. He gave up four goals, basically, So in, uh, and was pulled, you know, to, you know, the empty net deal, that type of thing. That's why it's 4.02 in one game. So, yeah, it's a minutes and math type of thing. Wild do not beat the Calgary Flames. The Wild do not beat the Calgary Flames. We'll say 4-3. Four 4-3, to three. Four to three, maybe a shootout type of deal, but I think the Calgary Flames shootout or overtime deal and the Wild's th- uh, proposed uh, three-game win streak that I've been talking about. I think Calgary win- ends the win streak, though, unfortunately, because that's just how it is. Some things never change. Calgary's a pain in the butt to play against, and um, that's just how it is. The Wild will not beat Calgary. With that said, we're going to look at the prospects now. Let's get moving. We like to open things up with the Iwija Wild, which are obviously not all prospects, but, uh, you know, a good chunk of them are. Dakota Mermis has been sent down, which really is a bummer. Unfortunately, he has an assist so far in the two games with Iowa. Uh, Dakota Mermis, yeah, he had five points in 13 games. And again, here we go again. See, this is, again, it's the, it's the way it's been in Iowa of late. It's extremely frustrating. Your leading scorers are all, you know, upper 20 year, upper twenty guys who've pretty much been, you know, the quad A career minor leaguer type guys like like Hira, uh, Judar Kaira, Jake Lucchini, and Nick Paton. Nick Paton is your leading scorer with 13 assists. One goal and 13 assists, and he's leading in scoring, so he's like the Zuccarillo of the, uh, he's literally the Zuccarillo of the Iowa Wild. Ryan O'Rourke now at five points. Okay. One goal or one goal and four assists. Carson Lambos has been picking it up of late. He'd been pretty invisible, but he's yeah, he's been getting better and better and he's played in seventeen games. He's been he's been there. Five points, four a uh, one goal, four assists. Vinny Letary's back up with Minnesota and he got a second goal, so good for him. Vinny Letary, thanks to the suspension of Ryan Hartman. Gosh. One assist for Damon Hunt in eight games. He's obviously been up with the Minnesota Wild and back down now with Iwija. Nick Sweeney missed a bunch of time. God, come on, Nick. Uh, one goal. One goal, one assist in six games. It's depressing, man. So I, I was not so great. There's one major, major positive there, and it ain't, and it ain't Zane McIntyre, who was a really nice minor league goalie for a long time. He's giving up almost four goals a game. Wow. Uh, Zero wins, five losses, two like overtime type of deals, and uh, eighty-seven point six save percentage. Where <laughs> Jesper Volstead, let's get to the positive now. 
2.14 goals against average, 6 and 4 record, save percentage just under 93. Just under 93. I'll say that again. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's pretty good, though. Um, it is. It's very impressive. But generally speaking, they're not scoring a whole lot, them being the Iowa Wild. Uh, the prospects, again, the main guy, the best the best skating prospect, pretty much, outside of Sammy Walker now with seven assists. He's been picking up in the assist category, but hasn't scored a single stinking goal, which is such a bummer. Come on, Sammy. Man, I'm rooting for you. You don't know how much. Oh, I want Sammy Walker to, to do something. Adam Beckman, I'm rooting for you too, man. Big time. But he's like, you know, two-thirds of a point a game. Just, ugh, you know, five goals, five assists. He's not, he's not dominating the AHL like some of us would have hoped he might. You know, like, at least Rossi would get, like, you know, it has 50 points and all that. Beckman's not going to get 50 points the way he's going. Lambos and Aurora showing some signs, some positive signs. But nothing too spectacular. They're minuses. Minus 6 in Lambos' case. Simon Johansson's a minus 10. Ugh, Kara's a plus 7. He's probably been the best overall player there in the minor leagues, and he's been in the NHL for some significant action over the years. Uh, it's just a minus team, you know. It, it really is. God, it's an absolute, it, they're just pitiful, and, and it's depressing, like, it doesn't matter who the coach is, it could be me, you know, and then it's like, okay, maybe not, but, maybe not me, but somebody with a little bit, little bit more hockey knowledge version of me, that kind of thing, maybe Derek, Derek Felska, coach of the uh, <laughs> Iowa Wild, <laughs> or some other podcast host that I don't, that I won't name, that think they're geniuses, maybe they'll, yeah, the record or belt be the same. It doesn't matter. That's just that's just there's just not much going on. Pavel Novak, at least he's healthy. Eleven games, two goals and an assist, three points. I don't know. I mean, it's not a whole lot to celebrate. Spachek is gray because he's uh he's been sent to down to the Iowa Heartlanders. That is hockey purgatory. <laughs> yeah, it's it is hockey purgatory, unfortunately. Uh, Pavel Novak was there for two games and had three points, so that was earlier. He's been kind of up and down. Hunter Jones, oh boy. Oh boy, Hunter Jones. I, I, I don't know what to tell you guys, guys and gals, in case there's some females uh, listening. Oh, there's, there should be a couple, yeah. I can think of a couple, like maybe Kathy Maines listening and maybe a few on Twitter. Hunter Jones, goals against average, 4.27. Because I don't, yeah, I haven't checked on the Iowa Heartlanders as much. I mean, they, Hunter Jones was thought of as a fairly significant uh, prospect at one point in time. He was a pretty high draft pick, right? He was a high draft pick, kind of, sort of. And he's given up over four goals a game for the Iowa Heartlanders. Now, Iowa's terrible. The other Iowa, the Heart, both of them are terrible. Yeah, 59th overall pick in 2019, but that is getting to be a while ago already. Ah, uh, 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 blah. This is depressing, man. Absolutely depressing. It's mostly guys that are kind of, you know, they're just young guys, middle-aged, you know, players. Most of the prospects that are, you know, like actual like graphics and such are on Iowa, the Iowa Wild. Iowa or Iowa, but they're on the Iowa Wild. Sorry, that didn't make any sense. <laughs> but um, there's just not a whole lot to brag about, not a whole lot to write home about. Let's look at the other prospects. I'm getting depressed looking at it, man. I'm, I'm sorry if that sounds kind of mean and arrogant, but... I'm getting depressed looking at it. I, I'm just telling you, man. I'm just telling you, man. First off, that would be Vladislav first off, former second-round pick, 2019, that same year. So, Hunter Jones and Vladislav first off. Uh, 11 goals, 10 assists, and 21 games in the KHL. And there's still hope of him coming to Minnesota. So, okay, that's good news. So, it sounds like they're not, like, writing him off just yet. That draft is not looking good at all. Let me tell you, it's not looking good at all. Beckman, yeah, you know. Boldy, Boldy even, is, you know, is he's supposed to be the star of that draft. He's, I guess he is. I mean, he's the closest thing. He did have a 30 goals last year, but I don't know. He's been disappointing. He, he's not going to get 30 goals right now unless he has 20 goals in March again. The March of Boldy. I don't know. I, I just don't know what to tell you about that, <laughs> that 2019 draft. Yeesh. 2020 draft, Rossi, very promising. Who's Nadinov? There's talk about him playing on the fourth line next season for Minnesota, so that's encouraging. Sochi, yeah, I gotta switch this up. Some of the numbers don't show up in Hockey Database, but they do show up in their rival uh, elite prospects, so, and all I'm getting is a spin right now. You know, the spinning wheel effect. That's great. It's really gonna help me so much. 
Oh boy, as my friend Paul once said, what's the spinning wheel shit? Oh boy, everything's acting up here. <laughs> so my apologies, I'm going to try to get this going here. But, because um, yeah, oftentimes the uh, Elite Prospects shows more of the uh, foreign players. Yeah, but like KHL now it's acting much better. That was strange. Because yeah, it wasn't showing uh, who's uh, Nadina at all with Sochi. I don't know why that is. So, oh, sorry about the delay. I really am. Yeah, Sochi, there, yeah, better, better. Yeah, because uh, with St. Petersburg, only it's still not great numbers, but yeah, St. Petersburg, he had no points in six games, but in Sochi, still the KHL, uh, four goals, five assists in 20 games, not great numbers. I mean, it's less than half a point a game. He's projected for 20 points in 58 games on the season. Nothing to write home about, but he can at least be on the bottom uh, six for Minnesota next year. That's what the talk is from like Russo and such, that they are focused on bringing him to Minnesota next year. Uh, probably not Iowa, but Minnesota. Merritt, who's not enough. I mean, he's been in the pros enough. The KHL is close enough to the... Uh, it's arguably better than the AHL. So, and, and it is, right? It should be. So, it's Russia's NHL for flip's sake. So, <laughs> sorry for almost dropping an F-bomb there. Uh, I'm going to move way, way up to Yurov and Ugrin and such. Pretty sure Ugrin still... Ogren is still out, unfortunately. I do believe so. Did he start playing? Finally, I haven't heard any good news. He has two games, and he scored a goal. All right. Ogren is back from the shoulder injury. Amen. Hallelujah. He did come back this week. So my apologies for being a little late on the late, late to the party there. But, uh, yes, yeah, so, sometimes when a guy's out that long, it's like, oh, oh, he played. Oh, whoa, sorry. <laughs> I apologize. That's pretty much what happened there. Swedish Hockey League, one goal in two games. So welcome back. Liam Ogren. No sarcasm at all. At all. And I'm dead serious here. Danila Yurov, who's obviously taken major steps forward. 25 points in 32 games. Awesome. 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 Awesome encouragement here. 48 points. He's projected for 48 points in 62 games. It's not like dominating, but it's not like Kirill Kaprizov dominated the KHL, but just the, the signs were insanely promising. That's what was going on with Kirill. Uh, you won't be seeing any MHL action this year from uh, Yurov. He looks extremely promising. 11 goals, 14 assists, if I didn't say that already. 25 points in 32 games. Awesome progress. Really love what I'm seeing here. Because remember, it was it two years ago? He had zero, zero points. Zero points. He's not, not a good thing, you know. It's not too good. But that's how it goes sometimes, guys. So it goes when you're 17 years old, don't expect a whole lot playing professional Russian hockey. It's not a, not a promising guy, you know. It's not a promising situation there. So take it easy, please. University of North Dakota, Nate Benoit, goose egg. Seven games, goose egg. That's all you need to know there. But at least it's with the hated North Dakota fighting Hawks. Kyle Masters. Okay, I didn't even mention him. Yeah, he's been in nine games so far with the... Iowa Wild, two assists so far for the defenseman who had 65 points last year with Cam Loops. That was awesome. Hopefully that will translate further and further as we move forward. Kyle Mosters, I know Bank here's out forever, so that sucks. Jack Pert, junior year with the St. Cloud State Huskies, only three points, one goal, two assists. Again, more of a defensive minded defenseman for St. Cloud State. But um, yeah, promising there, at least for the most part. I, I, yeah, it's talk is he's going to be with Iowa next season. Petrovsky, OHL, Owen Sound Attack. This is we're moving up now. 19 year old guys, 2022 draft now. 23 points in 24 games. He's certainly not dominating, but he's slightly ahead of last year's pace, where he had 55 points in 62 games. He's about a point a game guy now. Center for the Owen Sound Attack, right? Yep. So, <laughs> Michael Milne, ACL. It sucks. It's depressing. Yep, he's the other one who's on the IR. Ah, uh, it does suck hardcore. Ryan Healy, Harvard. Harvard, yep. Almost at last year's point total as a defenseman. Definitely picking it up. Doing a Kyle Masters this year. That's, I'm, I'm, I, I love it. Unfortunately, a minus six. But Harvard is not exactly a national powerhouse in the hockey world. Seven games, six points. Awesome. Two goals, four assists. Just two assists shy of last season's total in 34 games. I love to see these young guys take steps forward. And I'm happy for Ryan Healy. 121st overall pick in the fourth round in 2022. 
Reger Lorenz of Denver. He is ahead of last year already. Good job, man. Nice, nice, nice. Nice. Last year he was kind of that fourth line, nine points, 37 games. You know, at least he was a factor. But this year he's definitely much more of a factor, more middle sticks kind of level um, for a national powerhouse. <laughs> the Denver Pioneers, 10 points, six goals, six goals. Not you know, He's got more goals than assists now and four assists in 14 games. Promising. Nice to see the step forward already ahead of last year's point total for the right shot. Uh, I believe he's a left winger. Or excuse me, left shot. Why did I say right when I was looking right at it? Duh. Left shot, left wing. Hello. Ugh. I hate when I do that kind of stuff. Hunter hit. Yep, there we go. Well, you know, it's just he's one of those guys you're just waiting to see how he's going to translate to the pros. Obviously, puts up some nice numbers. Um, he's well ahead of, uh, yeah, he's well ahead of a point a game. 29 points. In 23 games, 9 goals, 20 assists. Definitely a playmaking center, but that that can score. Uh, there's a bit of stuff there, but again, how is it going to translate to the next level? That's the number one question for everybody. A guy that isn't translating to anything so far, except he finally scored a goal. Charlie Stramel in game number 8. Congratulations. Charlie Stramel scores for Wisconsin, but it was against us, wasn't it? Yeah, it was against us. That's great. Thanks for that. But uh, no, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. That was the week before. <laughs> that was the week before. Last week was Michigan State. Excuse me. Ay, yeah, yeah. Sorry. He finally scored a goal. Charlie Stramel, standing ovation. It's about time. One goal, no assists for Chuck. Charlie. Oh, the name Charlie around here is not feeling too good, is it? The Oshawa Generals, Kumpalainen. In the OHL, not in, not over there in Finland like Miko Koivu years ago or other guys like Capo Kakinen, but he came to the uh, North America pretty early too. 22 points, 22 games, 10 goals, 12 assists, and he's and he's even in the plus minus category, which is always important. Riley Hate, Mr. Height, Height, not Hate, Height, double. He is he is a double point guy. Wow, he had an amazing week, an amazing week. 23 games, 13 goals, almost as many goals as games. That's not that far off, but 44 total points, 31 assists. He's a plus six. Riley Height. Again, I can't wait to see how he translates to the AHL and the NHL, hopefully the NHL. As a second-round pick, you hope he's an NHL prospect. He's not just, like, a guy who's going to, you know, you know, he's just going to be stuck in purgatory, you know, ECHL, AHL for the rest of his life. No. Riley Height, there's got to be a pretty good chance. This guy looks like one of the better picks, I think. Uh, <laughs> as long as he's not absolutely horrific defensively, this guy has a future in the National Hockey League, man. Double points? That's a, uh, yeah. It's one thing to have really good numbers in the juniors. Like, okay, you know, but, but this guy's dominating, though. This guy's dominating. Uh, Rossi dominated, too, and it took a while to translate to the NHL. And the myocarditis, and then the frustration of this and the frustration of that and adjusting to professional hockey versus uh, juniors and such. It was a tough go, especially with, again, the myocarditis. But, um, yeah, so it was a little bit slower for him. Riley Hyde, I'm uh, very intrigued. He, he has got to be one of the absolute top prospects in the wild system right now. That uh, Who's not on the wild roster, that type of thing. He, You know, out, yeah, outside of Jesper Volstead, I, th- I, th- I think it's him. Right now? Oh, no. Well, you got Yurov and Ogren, too. Sorry. But that's your big four. There's your Mount Rushmore, I think. If you can name another one, let me know. Because I don't think it's Huznadinov. I don't think he's a top four prospect in the Wild organization at the moment. Notice I said it with a Canadian accent because that's how I roll with organiza- organization. Yeah. Uh, outside of Jesper Valsted, I don't think any of the others have 21. Uh, 22, Yurov and Ogren. Ogren, hopefully, you're off. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, I think it's Height, man. I, I, I don't think he's the Washington necessarily. That's Jesper Volstead. But Height just might be Thomas Jefferson, man. <laughs> Let's keep going. Aaron Pronk, University of Minnesota Duluth. Off to a great start. Off to a great, great, great start. But he's 20 years old. So he's got a little bit of that extra advantage. Kind of like uh, uh, Kaprizov did coming to the NHL. And I think, uh, you know, uh, who's the Dinoff will next year as well because, you know, been around a bit. But nine points in 13 games as a defensive, and you can't really complain about that. Eight assists. He's doing a good job from Hermantown again. Like, he's from that area, kind of, sort of. It's pretty close to Duluth. It's a hockey dynasty, at least it used to be. Caleb Paca. 
Kalen Parker, 13 points, 12 assists as a defenseman. Good for you, man. For the Moose Jaw Warriors, one of the cooler names out there. Kalen Parker, again, only 19 years of age. And Jimmy Clark of the Minnesota Golden Gophers, who's been, again, this is where, this is like the number one pick in the NFL draft years ago versus uh, uh, Brock Purdy, who was Mr. Irrelevant and might lead the 49ers to a Super Bowl. He just might. He just might. And if not for that Tommy John injury last year, that was really depressing. Who knows? Maybe they could have beaten Philly. Uh, maybe. But Philly was probably the best team in the league last year. I think the Chiefs were kind of lucky a little bit. <laughs> just imagine that. Yeah, stupid. Um, but anyhow, um, get off that right now. But this is kind of a similar comparison where first-round picks can be kind of disappointing, and then you get the seventh-round guy, and, well, he's, he's ahead of him. They're both playing at the college hockey level. He's playing, you know, obviously with a very promising and a powerhouse of a program in the University of Minnesota, but Wisconsin's a lot better this year. Mike Hastings is doing well, so hopefully Charlie Strumel turns it around, and I, I, I want to believe he will. A lot of people's eyebrows were raised with that pick. They're kind of like, uh, I don't know. We'll see. But Jimmy Clark's doing more than Charlie Strumel. It, it's just a, a stone-cold fact. Does Jimmy Clark translate to the National Hockey League as a better player than Strumel? Not yet, but, well, he's doing more at the college level so far. So you, you can't write that off, I'm afraid. Maybe I'm just acting like a fool right now, but it is the same level of play. It, it is. It, it, it's, Minnesota is not the 80s Oilers, necessarily, where everybody's getting spectacular statistics. You know, like, holy crap, or the early 90s Penguins. And then they go to another team, and yeah, the numbers aren't quite as good. Minnesota's good this year, but they're not like last year's team, necessarily. And even still, it's not like the Gophers are beating everybody eight to nothing either. So, <laughs> or like eight to two or something. Like Edmonton Oilers just owned hockey throughout about a uh, what was it like at least a five year period, and then they traded Gretzky. <laughs> they traded Gretzky because his wife wanted to be in L.A. to be an actress. Uh, I don't know. Sorry, I'm still. Yeah, that's one of those that kind of still sticks on your mind, no matter how many years ago it was. Dominique Wilkins for Danny Manning in the NBA. That's another one. <sighs> What's the local one? Uh, Larry Murphy for Jim Johnson. Spectacular trade, guys. Just, I, that's where grit and speed or grit and skill, you need to take your grit and shove it up your putoxis. Take your grit and shove it. Jim Johnson was gritty. Dang, I, I'm so glad he was. But Larry Murphy was a Hall of Famer. That's all you need to know, folks. Take your grit, because it ain't shit. There, I said it. I swore. Oh, my God. The show's finished. Canceled. Okay, so with that said, that's pretty much the prospects. Probably not the best analysis on the planet, necessarily, but at the same time, it's keeping you up to date with how the players are doing. And Riley uh, Riley Height, I am, you know, absolutely... Hunt, what am I talking about? Yeah. Riley Height. I'm getting him mixed up with Hunter Height again. Imagine that. <laughs> Height and Height. Yeah, I know. Riley Height is. I'm just very intrigued, man. I'm very intrigued. I know it's just the juniors, but there's something. There's something, man. There's something, and I think he does translate to something better as we move forward. With that said, we're going to take a quick break and get to an epic, fun fan interaction segment as it always is. We are back here on Brave, the Wild Fan Interaction segment. But first, we jump into that. We're going to hear from our sponsor, Raycon. So, really, really, uh, <laughs> really happy that it's the Christmas season once again. Uh, the one thing is stores are busy, everything's crazy, and it can be absolutely hectic. So, that's just kind of how it goes. It may be too early to start decorating for Christmas, but no, it actually isn't anymore. But <laughs> it's, no, it's no longer too early to start decorating for Christmas. But it's never too early to start your holiday and Christmas shopping 
Why not take care of it now before the crowds and packed calendars make shopping a total nightmare? Especially when you can get some of the best deals of the season, well, before Black Friday, well, which is what the case was. At the same time, you got cyber, and that makes it a lot easier as well. You can shop Raycon products right now and save up to 50% off because of their early Black Friday sales going on now. Yep, and it's still happening. Um, you've heard me talk about Raycon products before. I personally own the blue ones, the, the Raycon Pro. Absolutely wonderful. Or the, the everyday, sorry. I keep getting them mixed up. But they are wonderful. Um, I wear them all the time. Uh, they absolutely, absolutely, uh, the, the quality is there. Like music-wise, you're going to hear exactly what, this, what it's supposed to sound like. You're going to hear the podcast very clearly. Regardless if I regardless if I don't have the volume up enough or whatever, it's going to be quality stuff. Like that's on me if I mess up the quality of the audio, and I hope I don't. Uh, but the, the Raycons aren't going to let you down. They do a fantastic job. Um, Raycon first made a name for themselves in the audio space with products like their Everyday Earbuds. Yeah, that's the one, the Everyday. Known for deliver, delivering high-quality and thoughtful features like a 32-hour battery life. And a near perfect in your fit. Yes. Yep. They don't fall out. Yep. And plus, you have the adjustable sizes that are inside as well um, for all day wear and lasting comfort. And this year, they expanded their entire business with the introduction of Raycon Home and PowerTech. So absolutely great. So you want to get those. Uh, you want to get those uh, Raycon Homes or the PowerTechs. Absolutely wonderful. Um, their five-star reviewed Magic 80, uh, 180 cable allows you to charge iOS, micro, USB, and Type-C devices eight times faster with 100-watt power delivery. So, yep, it charges. It does charge insanely fast. Yes, and I am saying that. I'm vouching for that right here personally. It does. Um, their faucet filter ultra filters the water in your tap against chlorine and heavy metals. It's a must-have for ensuring the water you use to wash your face and brush your teeth is. Yep, so like you're getting ready, but you're still listening to the podcast. You're still listening to Brave the Wild. You're still listening to Crease and Assist. Yep, you're still listening to shows like that. You know, you know, really good hockey shows that are worth it. Um, obviously, <laughs> yep, I like Locked on Wild as well. Uh, sorry. Raycon is known for delivering high-quality and thoughtful features at half price for other premium tech brands. It's no wonder their products have racked up tens of thousands of five-star reviews. Absolutely. To get everyone in the holiday shopping spirit a bit early and currently as well, Raycon is currently offering 20% off everything on their site with select products up to 50% off. 50% off. That's unbelievable. So beat the crowds. And, and avoid the crowds as well with online. <laughs> Beat the crowds, crowds and save now. Trust me, you do not want to miss out. Yeah, the, the Raycon's early Black Friday sale. Hurry now to buy, see what I mean? Hurry now to buy Raycon.com slash THPN. See, you don't have to deal with crowds at all. To get 20 to 50% off site-wide, that's buy Raycon.com slash THPN to score up to 50% off Raycon products. Buy Raycon.com slash THPN. P N, and do enjoy. You will like them very much, and I am endorsing that personally right here, right now. <laughs> With that said, I, uh, Brave the Wild's uh, fan interaction. I had it here. There we go. It's like where'd it go? <laughs> where did it go? I have no idea. So, yep, we will hear from Derek Felska's. Uh, love these polls very much. Yep, and I, I, I love that he hashtags BGWMN. And I'm gonna. Hashtag mine from now on. This week I was lazy and didn't do a single poll. And I apologize. I, I had some ideas and then my mind blanked. And kind of a busy, weird week, you know. Kind of weird week. Plus I was finishing up the Mega Man video game flashback. Mega Man video game flashback. The original Mega Man, 1987. One of the hardest games ever made from Capcom. Video game flashback. The uh, 20, was it uh, episode 23? Yep, it's been released. Do check it out. Please do. And I'm working on the breakthrough one. That one's almost done already. That was a quickie. Derek also interacted with that, and I, God, I appreciate that. You don't know how much. <laughs> it, it's wonderful. Uh, video game flashback brings me back to great memories. So, sorry, now I'm changing the subject and all that. I'm sorry, Derek. Hashtag Crease Assist. Hashtag BTWMN. This is a poll. What can be done to stop the Minnesota Wild freefall? Uh, yep, this is very telling. Very telling how this turns out, but or can anything be done at all, or should it? Please retweet. And then um, the choices are fire the coaching staff. Well, they kind of did. Trade slash move players. That's what I picked, and that finished third. A very low, lousy third. 
file Bill, uh, Bill Guerin for bad choices. That finished last. Nope, embrace the suck. That won 53.8. Nope, embrace the suck. I picked the trade and moved players. But uh, fire, firing Dean Everson and Bob Woods. I didn't even mention Bob Woods, and I apologize. Yep, he was in charge of the penalty kill. And, uh, yeah, so now we got the um, AHL coach coming up to help. Not, obviously, uh, not obviously uh, McLean, but the, uh, I forgot the new guy. So, um, so I'll look him up here in a second here. But, uh, yep, we did end up firing two of the coaches. And, you know, and you kind of figured that Bob Woods would be in trouble, no doubt. Patrick Dwyer. Yep, that's who it was. I remember, yep, looks like a young guy, and, well, he's off to a good start. That's encouraging. He's in charge of the penalty kill. Patrick Dwyer, D-W-Y-E-R. So, uh, yes, and he does look like a young guy. So we'll see how that turns out. There was the tweet, the big one from ESPN at the time. I was like, oh, big news. Wildfire coach Dean Everson and assistant Bob Woods after 5-10-4 start to the season. Have a couple of responses there. Derek Velska says... I remember years back when the team suddenly started working hard after Mike Yo was canned. It made it clear the team had been sandbagging it, even though he avoided calling out the very players who had given up on him. Yep, like <laughs> all the way down to Parisi Suter, all, all the way up to Parisi Suter. Some players eventually gave up on Torch, too, and Suter was a jackass to him. I know that much. Um, I think he basically told him, like, what the bleep are you going to do? Or It was something along those lines. Mike, now who called him uncoachable? I think it was Mike Yo. You're bleeping uncoachable. No. That was Torch. Torch called, uh, if I remember correctly. I could be wrong. Pretty sure it was Torch, though. The other guy with the Boston the Boston voice, you know. That that suitor, he's freaking uncoachable. I'm not coaching that guy. He's a jackass. Get him out of here. Oh, great. He signed to like 50 years and like 100 million. Ah, bleep this crap. Well, still hire me anyway. I'd like to be the coach if you'd hire me, but God, that guy's uncoachable. Okay, I guess you're not going to hire me. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that's pretty much what happened. <sighs> Derek continues, It will be interesting to see how this Minnesota Wild team responds if they suddenly play a lot better. Then you find out they gave up a Dean Nevis and if there's no change, you just find out simply they're not good. Actually, that was probably the first tweet, so I kind of went out of order there. I'm apologizing. Because I think he was replying to something I'd said better than I'd have replied to it. Yep. Actually, no. It's uh, He was replying to Tom Han and such. Tom Hayen, there he is. Tom Hayen says, guessing you will see a bump, yep, that will last 7 to 10 days. After that, it'll be an interesting to see where the special teams are and if the level of undisciplined play has subsided. Derek Felska says, fair assessment, I think the honeymoon will be short and we'll be back to soul-searching soon enough. I think so, too. Tater Tot Hawk Dish. Tater Tot Hawk Dish. Cool name. <laughs> I would like to see what he does in the first practice. That must be a Tynes. He has to get them gelling with other players. Then two or three, then two or three, they always play with uh, under Dean. So, yeah, it's going to be super interesting how it all turns out. So we continue here briefly. Apologize here. Apologize. Obviously, that was the that's the main theme of the show. I barely didn't even review the games at all, which, I don't know. It's how it goes sometimes. Continuing upward. Yep, those are ones I just read. Yep. Uh, yes, I was hashtagging uh, a text. Michael Russo sa- uh, showed a text from Dean Evison. Michael Russo says, classy text from Minnesota Wild, former Minnesota Wild coach Dean Evison. I am so thankful to have been given the opportunity to work with the Minnesota Wild organization, organization, especially the amazing fan base for the past few years. Can't wait to see where he, uh, yep, and then, yep, so that was, uh, that was Dean Everson, and then Russo says, can't wait to see where he ends up next. Won't be long. I agree, you know, and I do feel bad. I like Dean Everson. Was it time for a change? Yeah. Yep. Unfortunately, yes. Um, it it kind of is what it is. It was. It kind of is what it is, but certainly not rooting against Dean Everson there. Uh, <laughs> Derek, Derek says, meh. Should anyone be surprised at what he said on his way out? I Yeah, I get that. It is kind of uh, stock, isn't it? The organization showed more patience than any other NHL coaches receive. Yeah, you do have a good point there. You do. Other organizations, he might have been gone like last year. Yeah, uh, at the end of the season, might have been let go. Again, uh, plus, if he wants to work in this league in the future, he's smart to uh, to go score to go scorched earth in this moment. Yeah. 
like what the bleep, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Some good points there. Some good points. And I do understand it's kind of a stock response. Yes. I feel you there. I do. Okay. The Derek Velska lightning round has returned. Duh. I had to say it like an uh, evangelist. It has returned. Okay, anyhow. Does the effort level on Tuesday by the Minnesota Wild confirm that some of the players are sandbagging it for Dean Evison? Probably, or just just kind of, it was like a wake-up, kind of like you guys, you know, you, you've just, you know, were there. they, they might have been. And sometimes when you hear the same voice, the same voice, you get tired of it. Uh, you know, some people just don't listen, and believe me, in the workplace, there's way too much of that. Luckily, it's not as uh, result-driven as the NHL, where people get... Because <laughs> a lot of times, it's the, the people being jackasses. It's not the manager or the supervisor being bad, or, or the coach in this case, being bad or being a jerk. It's the players being a jerk. And so if that's the case, yeah, it's extremely frustrating. And that's the crappy part of this world. It really is. Um I don't know. I like. I don't know why a Charlie Coyle would sandbag it. Just I don't know if it's just, he's just not hearing the right response, or maybe Dean Everson was harder on him than you'd think, and it wasn't really helping. I'm not sure what to think of it. But supposedly, yeah, supposedly he, he probably could get pretty tough behind the scenes, and it wouldn't surprise me honestly. Where t- uh, Hines, obviously he's demanding and so on and so forth. So we'll see what demanding means. We'll see what results it really brings you at the end of the day. So, yeah, continuing. Do you agree with Wild GM Bill Guerin's assertion during his press conference for introducing John Hines that the players were bullied by Emerson? Huh. Doesn't that make Guerin look like a hypocrite for his kick-to-the-ass talk before the Sweden trip? Very interesting. Yes. Yeah, it, it does. Hmm. Maybe that was like a, a boldy, but didn't... Bill Guerin, yeah, see, like, yeah, good, good cake there. Like, didn't Bill Guerin take Boldy in his office at the end of the season, and then Boldy came out like, yeah, he went in six feet two, and he came out five foot two, if you know what I mean, that type of thing. So yeah, that is that is kind of hypocritical, huh? Yeah, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> and then of course, yeah, they never mentioned the term of the the coach contract. Like, ah, that's so dumb. That's so dumb. It doesn't make any sense. It's like. I, I, I don't know, like, okay, five years, three years, one year, two years, just say it, like, yeah, see, it's stuff like that, I wasn't overly impressed with this press conference either, I'm, I, I can tell Derek was not impressed, at least I'm pretty sure he wasn't, I wasn't either, um, yeah, I don't know, I won't say Bill Guerin's losing me, because I still like Bill Guerin, generally speaking, but uh, I'd say I don't like everything, you know, I definitely don't, especially these, uh, these veteran signings, this weekend, in a game between Ottawa and Florida, an official an official gave all 10 skaters on the ice game misconduct. Should we see more of this in games where it becomes a clown show on the ice? I think so. Yeah, where it's just getting to be too much, right? Just too much. Like, we've had enough game misconduct to all of you. That must have really been something. That must have really been something. Yeah. Man, I'm a, <laughs> that had to. Have, I can't even imagine the shock of the fans and the players. Like, what the bleep? What just happened here? <coughs> because, um, but yeah, if it's a clown show, maybe they should. Like, like it should kind of send a message. Like, okay, guys, play hockey. This isn't. We're not going to just cheap shot everybody and look for a fight every ten seconds. So, yeah, that that's that's actually yeah, sure. Here we go. Oh, oh. <laughs> if the, yep, I love these. If the Minnesota Wild were a video game console, what would it be? <sighs> and some fans, you know, here's the thing. I'm going to say it because it's a game system that I, I had hopes for. Maybe not this season in terms of the Wild as much as previous years. I had hopes for, and then right away it was like, ugh. The Nintendo 64. <gasps> Did I say that? Yeah, because I can imagine certain people listening that love the Nintendo 64. Oh, I grew up with that. Ah, da, da, da. Yeah, it sucked. I didn't like it at all. It was a massive disappointment. Massive. You came in, had high hopes. Ooh, it's the next level from the Super Nintendo. Oh boy, I can't wait to see, you know, like say, like they're going to make this Earthbound game. It never came. So that's disappointing in itself. Zelda. Oh, it's the greatest game ever. Is it though? 
within about a, a, a couple hours, I'm like, you know, Zelda is meant to be a 2D. I feel Zelda is meant to be a, a 2D type of a game. You know, bird's eye view. Link to the Past, Link's Awakening, Zelda 1. Uh, side scroll for Zelda 2 was, was a, a fun change, but it was like one time. But to go permanently to 3D, eh, you know, eh, doesn't do much for me. Um, obviously, Castlevania was an unbelievable disappointment. Talk about a game that never meant to be 3D, uh, a, a, a series. So, I don't know. Maybe it's just like the generational change, but the controls sucked. The controls absolutely sucked. Yeah, you know, it's like Zelda when you're trying to fire an arrow and stuff. Some of you might think, oh, what's his problem? No, I, I couldn't stand it. It was a pain in the butt, like trying to shoot an arrow at the enemy. Um where you had to manually move this tiny little joystick to aim. That's garbage. Uh, you know, that's garbage. Let the, let the, have the gauge on the screen a little bit, like kind of be more automatic-ish. Or maybe it's not going to be accurate all the time. It's going to move around, but you got to time it and such. I don't know. So bottom line, the N64, you had super high hopes, and then it, maybe not necessarily this year, but you had high hopes for the wild, hoping for something especially with Bill Guerin and blah, blah, blah. You know, you, you, this would be like over the course of the last couple of years, like say those promising seasons. I don't mean this particular year. Like if it was this year's team, yeah, it's more like the freaking uh, virtual boy where you're like, eh, I don't know, we'll see. And then, nope, it sucked. That kind of thing. <laughs> but overall, N64. And hate me all you want, N64 fans. I don't like the N64. Sorry, I just don't like it at all. It sucks. Sorry. So that's as we say that uh, the 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 what you call it the lightning round continues in Russo's article about the firing of Dean Evison. He discussed the nudging from team owner Craig Leopold to make a move. Is is his insistence on making the playoffs no matter what a hindrance by making it impossible for the Wild to rebuild? Yes, yes, I don't like that. That's kind of the same thing the Vikings are too. Like. Even the year the Vikings were terrible, the years the Vikings were terrible under Zimmer, we were still kind of, you know, oh, you know, we missed the playoffs, but we won seven, eight games, whatever, you know, which is almost 500-ish. So we were picking in the middle of the draft and stuff. And like when the Wild had their quote-unquote bad years, you know, we were picking in the, kind of in the middle of the draft. Luckily that one year we got pretty fortunate with the ninth pick and hopefully Rossi ends up becoming something special. I think it is a hindrance. It's like forcing things and that's why you're keeping these meh veterans and I think meh is the word, right, Derek? Meh. Absolute meh. Like, the Ryan Hartman one, I think, pissed me off the most. The sec, the fat, well, maybe the Felino one. 32 years old, and you sent him for four years and gave him a raise? With the puke show he displayed in the postseason last year? He had one really good game, but he was kind of, I don't know, acting like Travis Kelsey almost. He was almost Travis Kelsey standards. That's how he was behaving. Settle down. Settle down. <laughs> stuff like that drove me nuts. If you haven't, if you haven't noticed, I do not like. I flat out despise Travis Kelsey and everything he stands for, especially his attitude on the field. Just enough. Shut the, shut the, you know, fill in the blanks. Yes. <laughs> so yes, and that's kind of how. Sometimes that's kind of how I see Felino. Sometimes, at least, that's how he was behaving in the playoffs last year. He made a jackass of himself, to be quite honest. So yeah. Um, keeping him for four years, four out of four million and raise that, that pissed me off. I was like two years, three million, maybe. I don't even know if I want to do that, but maybe just to kind of, kind of sort of be a semi placeholder until the, uh, what you call it is over the, uh, cap hit. So, uh, oh man. Okay. So I'll continue. Uh, this is the end of the entire thing looks like, huh? So. Derek Falska, if the Minnesota Wilds somehow manage to make the playoffs and are eliminated in the first round this season, uh, excuse me, excuse me, eliminated in the first round, should this season be seen as a success or failure, in your opinion? <sighs> success in terms of being able to get back to the postseason. Success is short-term success, but long-term, long-term failure, like in terms of. You're just spinning your tires. That's all you're really doing. You're just spinning your tires and not getting anywhere. Whether I'm grasping for straws or not, sometimes it's okay to get out of the middle. It, it, it's okay to get off the fence. Like bleep or get off the pot. That kind of thing. You know? That kind of thing. Bleep or get off the pot. 
And unfortunately, we're just kind of sitting on the fence. And I'm tired of the fence. A few years ago, this team looked extremely promising when we almost beat Vegas and we had that very good year. I believe that, but we still had those two schmucks here. And then the next year, things looked insanely promising. And then we couldn't beat the, the bleeping blues. It was, it was just like heartbreaking. Uh, you finally got those negative creepazoids out of here. Now my mind's stopping. Yeah, that was that was the I'm trying to remember which year was which year. The Vegas year, though, when the Wild almost beat Vegas, that was insanely promising. And then you had home ice versus St. Louis and couldn't take care of business there. It just you know, it's it's disappointing. Um, those those are two series that should have been won. Like the Wild should have beaten Vegas, should have beaten Vegas. Honestly, the Wild should have beaten the Blues. Absolutely, um, I think. Yeah, the Wild should have beaten the Blues. Plain and simple. It's just insanely disappointing in both cases. Just, you know, you would have felt a lot better. And then last year, you just kind of knew pretty early, even though, oh, game three, everything looks so promising. And Felino, oh, Felino, oh, he's so, he's, he's, he's really something. He has taken charge of this series. And yeah, no, he didn't. He made a fool the rest of the way. And he was making a fool before game three as well. So that's kind of my take on that. So long term, yeah, it's a, it's a failure. It would be just a short-term success, like, oh, it was a nice come, a nice comeback, nice recovery. But uh, other than that, wahoo, you know, that kind of thing. Meh, as you might say. With that, um, I miss you, Jay Bushy. I miss you, Brian Herrera, guys out there. Um, Tom Hayen, good to hear from you in the, in the response. But at least, yeah, it still got included, which is really nice. So I really appreciate that. Miss some of you guys out there. Keep, keep, in, keep interacting. Obviously, Derek, thank you so much. You are the... <clears throat> You are the blood of the show, and I just appreciate you so much. You know, and I'm blood in a very good way, the, the pillar. So really appreciate you so much. Obviously, good to hear from Tom Han. And was the tot there? So <laughs> as well, let's see, it's in there. It's not showing. Don't you just love that? Uh, tater Tot Hawk Dish. Yep, thank you so much. Really nice to hear from both of you, Tom Han and Tater Tot Hawk Dish. Hawk dish. So shout-outs to... Um, yeah, and sometimes it's my own fault for not interacting more often. I might get more going on. So that, maybe that's why people are like, whatever. He just screws around until like the, until the show is going to come out. So and I apologize for that. Um, yeah, uh, shout outs to MNW prospects. Of course, major shout out to you guys. Love you. Uh, Pavel Bennett, Justin Baki. Love you guys. Um, Brandon Quast, if you're still out there. I miss you. I haven't heard from you in a long time. Uh, Minnesota Wild Nation. Patrick Turner coming in out of Florida. Minnesota Wild Global. Scott Cavendish. You know, awesome, awesome Facebook pages for the Minnesota Wild. The hockey community is better than a lot of other communities. Let me tell you. It's special. Wish I was a player or a coach or something. I think it'd be amazing. Or even like a like an actual like paid writer, you know, professional. But podcast will do. And I appreciate every one of you that have been a part of this show. Um, really do really appreciate you that have been interacting with me and have uh, been been good friends. I really appreciate you. So with that said, we're gonna sign off for this week, and we'll see how the John Hines tenure continues. Maybe it's more promising than we think. Mm-hmm.